If you and your friends found yourselves on a field trip in the territory of not one, not two, but three murderous cryptids in the woods, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made by our grad students, try to make better decisions, and ultimately attempt to beat the cryptids in Dawn of the Beast. Sometimes college credit just isn't worth the aggravation, like when your spaced out professor and his furry fetish teaching assistant blackmail you into staying the night in a stretch of woods where people frequently go missing. That A- minus isn't worth getting your throat chewed out by a demon pervert who watches you through your windows before dragging you away to eat you alive. Since 1985, there have been 200 sightings of Bigfoot in the northeastern wilderness. They all occurred between September 4th and October 2nd every year. In the same area, in time frame, 54 people have gone missing or died. This time of year is called the Dead Month by locals. Everett and Marie are lounging in an isolated cabin. Admiring a stolen necklace, Marie says she wants to keep instead of pawning. Everett steps out for a smoke and notices movement. Rounding the house, he sees two piercing bright eyes staring out at him from the darkness. When Everett tosses a stick at them, the front light snaps on, revealing nothing is in the yard. Something topples the trash cans. Everett grabs a flashlight and warns Marie not to come outside before wandering into the night. Too bad Marie didn't hear him. As she goes to get a beer from the fridge, the bright eyes peer in at her from outside. She goes out to look for Everett and sees the bright-eyed creature. For some some reason, she decides to take a closer look. Everett, meanwhile, is stumbling around with the world's worst flashlight. He checks under a tarp, and when he stands, loud plodding footsteps draw near. He turns, and a Sasquatch roars and lunges for him. We cut back to Marie standing stock still in the yard, staring at the bright-eyed creature as if bewitched. Everett rushes up to her and says they have to go. She turns and tells him it's too late, that it is inside her. Suddenly, the bright-eyed creature grabs her by the ankles. Marie claws at Everett's arm before she's ripped away into the darkness. We get one parting shot of the creature as it crunches down on Marie. Turns out Bigfoot isn't the only cryptid in this neck of the woods. I feel like every national park mascot for the last 100 years has put out this exact warning about messing with wild animals. It's their forest, we're just visiting it. These shining eyes don't belong to Riddick, a band of thieves or murderers. We know that because humans don't possess Tapetum lucidum, the special membrane over the retina that gives off that shine in the dark. You know who does have that membrane? Every scary forest predator you've ever heard of. In upstate New York, where Everett and Marie's cabin are located, you can find black bears, bobcats, lynxes, boar, foxes, moose, and deer, all of which have that membrane over their eyes. However, only two currently known species in New York would have bright shining eyes as high off the ground as those of a fully grown human, the black bear and the moose. Both are territorial and have been known to attack humans if provoked. That means that the best thing that we're going to run into out there is a bear. That's the best outcome. The worst is getting your throat ripped out by mythological cannibal demons rumored to roam these parts. If we're in Everett and Marie's shoes, we're not going outside for anything if we see two shining eyes in the dark. There's simply no reason for them to leave the safety of their cabin here, and there's definitely no reason to wander off into the woods with a dollar store flashlight. Unless something attempts to break into your cabin, four walls and a lockable door are your first line of defense when a wild animal wanders past. Actually, the first line of defense is simply not living inside a literal cabin killing field. Now that I've pumped enough of my soul into grinding through the progression system in this RPG game called YouTube, I've unlocked the ability to brainwash, I mean influence you, to check out my sponsor, Gamersups. This is a siren song, and you're a frothing gullible little sailor who's going to grab the free sample pack of GG Neuron NOS with free shipping for the first 1,000 people, then 10% for the crawlers. Did you hear me? It's free to try. Even though you're brain is like putty in my hand. I'm still going to incept you with the why, so you can think you decided to try it yourself. Sustainable Brainwashing 101. Taste. I've been around the energy drink block and chemical soups like Bang taste like flavored antifreeze. Gamer subs taste like Mother Earth's natty juices. Smooth flavors with smoother energy. I like strawberry daiquiri too. Vitamins. Not your Fred Flintstone gummies. GG contains enough C, B, and D 
need to keep your brain cells from frying under the electrical storm caused by nootropics. These are the alphabet soup elements that load your neurotransmitters with enough ammo to solve any problem. Granted, your body can handle the G's, leading me to minerals. Even though your app is hopefully planted in an expensive gaming chair, your brain is nothing without its meat suit. And meat suits need shit like Coke 10 so your blood vessels don't rupture when you choke after getting the flank on an entire enemy team. Like an influencer Jedi, I'm gonna wave my pinky and you will order free GG samples and ingest the Russian Badger's own packaged ass vapor. Use code UNBEATEN for free shipping on the free pack. It costs you nothing to try, so get it. Ten years later, college students Oz, Jake, and Isabella enter your friendly neighborhood Sasquatch Center in search of lighter fluid. Meanwhile, in the car, Lily's boyfriend breaks up with her over text, and we meet Chris, a nerd so nerdy he makes a bunch of Bigfoot hunters look cool by comparison. Chris learns that the group has come out into the boonies to finish up a cryptozoology project for their master's programs. Back in the Bigfoot Emporium, we get a little exposition about Dead Month. People go missing in the area every year over a one-month period, and the theory is that Bigfoot took them. Oz is a big believer in the Squatch, but not in his murderous tendencies. Apparently, whoever sets the course requirements for Lily's photojournalism major has a sense of humor, or likes feeding people to monsters. Seriously, they could have picked any time frame to do this, and they chose what locals refer to as the dead month. If you stupidly choose to go camping where people regularly disappear, at least take the warning of those disappearances seriously. Between 1971 and 1983, at least 17 women went missing in Anchorage, Alaska. It was later discovered that serial killers killer Robert Hansen had abducted them, taken them into the wilderness in his biplane, and hunted them for sport before killing them. That's gonna be you if you ignore local warnings. The locals usually know their shit, so it's wise to heed their advice, as we'll see in another upcoming video on Wrong Turn. Considering they're coming here to look for Bigfoot, they should also be carrying walkie-talkies with them, so they can actually alert each other if they see him in the wild. Oh, and, you know, a Tyrannosaurus 2 bore double-barreled super shotgun launching 34 millimeter half pound hunks of lead. Half kidding. The double deuce weighs 30 pounds, has an atrocious aim down side speed, and the ADS sway is wild due to the weight. A more practical option would be the .577 Nitro Express double rifle, or some type of modern high capacity DMR with thermal goggles. You know, standard kit for these kind of things. A first aid kit might be nice too, just in case Chewbacca manages to tear off one of our arms. Out in the woods, their professor, Dr. Kasdan waxes poetic about Bigfoot with the passion of a tenured guy who knows he can't get fired for forcing his students to join in in his weird hobby for the weekend. I suppose we're lucky his thing isn't river bathing. He tells the students to wander around looking for footprints, fur, and scat that might prove the big guy's existence. He also mentions that forest cryptids have been known to throw rocks at people as a warning, and the grand tradition of making terrible choices. Oz, Jake, and Isabella immediately ditch their nerdy professor and and their nerdiest interloper, Chris, to wander off the trail in search of Bigfoot. Meanwhile, Lily stumbles across a Sasquatch footprint in the mud, as well as Everett, the guy from the open, who seems to have lost an eye and grown a country accent since we last saw him. He tells her the footprint is the mark of the beast. He asks her where she's staying in the creepiest way possible, and when she won't tell him, he warns her she's basically bait, wandering around in the woods by herself. I've seen scouts organize better than this. For starters, to find uncontaminated evidence and anything to take back to the real world, the group needs to methodically search the woods, either by marking off a grid and investigating sections and pairs, or by staying together and moving efficiently through pieces of territory. This increases the likelihood that smaller evidence, such as tufts of fur and scat, as well as footprints, are noticed and preserved before someone accidentally destroys them. It also prevents individual students from getting lost in the woods or kidnapped by forest weirdos like Everett. Chris gets left behind to look at birds. Lily wanders off on her own. Dr. Kasdan seems to be on his own trip, wandering off somewhere. Especially if you're in a forest you're not familiar with, getting lost can be as simple as losing sight of the trail while distracted or twisting your foot and falling down a hill. It's even worse when you lack any means of communication with your team. If you were going to go off trail to look for Bigfoot, it'd be smart to bring a topographical map of the area 
Nvidia, as well as a satellite-based GPS tracker. Or if you can't afford one, a simple option would be to bring ribbon or twine to tie around trees as you move through the forest, so you can turn around and follow them back to the trail. As for Everett, Lily was smart to only give him general information, but ultimately she doesn't need to tell him anything at all. Even telling him they're staying in a cabin is probably more detailed than he should have. She should probably just lie and tell them that they're staying in town. She should also take a photograph of him as she's walking away and then share that photo with her group so they know what he looks like in case he suddenly appears around the cabin. Nearby in a meadow, Jake steps in shit and falls beside a discount skeleton from Spirit Halloween. Oz tells him the scat probably belongs to Bigfoot. Jake and Isabella want to cut the trip short and report the body to the police, but Oz has come too close to realizing his furry fetish fantasies with Bigfoot to, to turn back now. He tells them the body's at least eight years old and can wait a few more days to report. Otherwise, he'll double the amount of homework that they'll need to turn in to pass the class. They reluctantly agree to stay quiet about the body, and when no one's looking, Isabella dabbles in a little grave robbing as she steals the necklace off the corpse, the same necklace Marie was wearing the night she was taken. Reporting remains you find is a gray area, morally and legally. Depending on which state you live in, the protocol ranges from being lawfully required to contact police and the coroner's office to just registering the fines with local historical groups. If it's on your property, some states say you can do whatever you want with them. I mean, you should probably report it, but you know, I understand it's, it's a lot of paperwork. Oftentimes, the bones are usually animals, but even medical examiners have been fooled at first by bones that appear human, only to belong to somebody's pet. Why risk it? As recently as 2020, remains belonging to a kid were found on a New York property. Police were called and an investigation is still ongoing. Not to mention that Oz isn't a forensic anthropologist or a medical examiner. Bodies can reach a skeletal phase within as little as one month, depending on the climate, bacteria, bugs, and animal damage. For all they know, this is a relatively fresh crime scene where evidence could still be gathered if they don't trample all over it. Stealing the necklace is obviously a bad idea. But not not because we found out later that the necklace is cursed. It's a bad idea because messing with a corpse like this would likely obstruct any police investigation that could happen, potentially destroying evidence and earning Isabella jail time and or a fine depending on which law they decided to charge her with. Back with Dr. Kasdan, Chris spots something moving through the woods with his binoculars. Kasdan tells him it's time to call it quits for the night. The group returns to the cabin Everett and Marie once shared. In search of cell service, Isabella and Dr. Kasdan and start driving out to a nearby town. Left to his own devices, Chris finds a book called Forest Unseen. Somehow, he's able to read the doctor's scrawl inside. It tells him that the night brings evil, the Wendigos. But with the dawn comes the light of Bigfoot. Deeper in the book, the pages warn him, here they come. I think we can all agree, never read the creepy handwritten book out loud. Even if you don't have common sense, seeing something like this should be a red flag. It might not inspire you to break for the car and speed out of this forest like a bat out of hell right now, but once things start going down, this is exactly where you should turn to for more information. Chris reads all of four lines and then forgets to tell anyone about it until a day later. He should have given it to Oz to obsess over. He's their resident mythologist. He would happily spend all night going through that thing and then tell us the highlights as soon as shit starts to hit the fan. Lily goes to take a shower in the world's dimmest bathroom and something goes bump in the night. She closes the window but gets ambushed by Everett who subdues her. Lily is in a vulnerable position in the bathroom, but also one where quick action could save her from being kidnapped. For one thing, Lily should scream the second she sees him and when he covers her mouth with a chloroform rag. She should kick the wall with her feet so loudly that Chris, Oz, and Jake can hear her. Form in the movies also isn't like form in real life. Real form has been tested extensively on animals, but use on humans stopped a long time ago after they found that exposure can lead to liver function and cardiac arrest. Anecdotally, from times when it was used as an anesthetic, however, the chemical took around five minutes to incapacitate a human. Lily would have time here to fight back, namely by landing a sharp elbow shot to his stomach to push him back, then grabbing the mirror on the wall and smashing it over his head, or by clawing at his only remaining eye to blind him. Out on the dark road, Isabella's 
spots a creepy, bloody woman standing in the middle of the road. Kasdan doesn't seem to see her, and when Isabella looks back, the person is gone. She looks over and sees Kasdan has been replaced by the band member from Kiss and drives them into a tree. When she comes to, a Wendigo breaks Kasdan's window and tears out his throat before pulling him through the window. Isabella scrambles out of the car and Crab crawls to the dark road. She turns and Wendigo Marie screams at her. Something unseen pulls her into the air and breaks her neck. God damn. It. Please tell me we aren't dealing with some OP supernatural bullshit. Why can't we just have normal Wendigos from Until Dawn that are simply vicious, demented creatures born out of cannibalism? Not these things that somehow harness Charles Xavier's telepathic abilities. On that note, maybe we need to be more cautious with the whole cannibalism thing. Don't want to turn into a Wendigo. I digress. As for Isabella's ghost road, her best option here when she sees someone standing in the road is to drive around this person and keep going. If the person needs help, they'll call out. Otherwise, they could be a distraction while thieves or worse sneaks up on the car. Classic damsel in distress ambush setup. Seen it a million times. She can't do much about Kasdan, but it's terrible instinct to slam on the gas and plow them into a tree, especially since it turns out this car doesn't have airbags. Isabella needs to check on Dennis as quickly as possible to make sure he's still breathing and has a pulse. If he does, she needs to get him help before moving him, and then hold his neck in place until help arrives. This is called holding C-spine. If he needs CPR before then, she should take him out as gently as possible to perform it, or attempt to do it in the car if the seat can go back enough and give her enough room. Moving a trauma victim can be terrible for their back, but it's better than them dying. Of course, this is all moot once the creature attacks. Getting out of the car and running is probably her best option, but in that case, she needs to hope that the creature is too busy munching on Kasdan to watch her sprinting into the distance. Freezing isn't an option. Her two options are racing for the cabin or racing for town, and which she should go for depends on how long they were traveling before the wreck. Ultimately, Isabella was just unlucky, and it probably wouldn't have mattered which way she ran. Not with a cannibalistic Professor Rex on her ass. Back at the cabin, Jake's vibing to reggae. Chris dons a miner's light to go pee outside because Lily's still in the bathroom. Just as he opens the door, something outside throws a rock at the window. He retrieves the gun he found before venturing into the woods. He tucks it in the front of his pants and then goes to pee when another rock hits him. Heavy footsteps approach behind him. He fires the gun, but Bigfoot knocks it out of the way, picks Chris up, and slams him into a tree before dragging him deeper into the woods. None of this should be happening. If the bathroom is taken, then go in the sink, or a potted plant, or just hold it, especially when something outside throws a rock at you. And if you have to go outside, walk to the edge of the porch, aim for a leaf, and let it go. If you decide, like a total idiot, to wander into the woods to pee, then don't aim the firearm you don't know how to use at your junk. I bet Chris couldn't find the safety on that gun if he tried. He's only lucky Bigfoot knocked it out of his noob hands before he shot his Johnson off, or worse, shot one of his friends by accident. Unfortunately, Chris was probably the only student too far away from Kasdan to hear his trivia about cryptids throwing stones as warnings earlier. Still, if something hurls a rock in my face as I'm stepping outside, I'm not stepping outside. Super simple stuff. North American animals don't throw rocks, so it's either a human messing around or one of them cryptids the locals were talking about. Chris isn't prepared for either possibility. Still, if he's gonna bring a gun with him, the moment he hears something stomping around behind him, he should have it in his hand ready to fire. Lily wakes up bound with duct tape in Everett's truck bed with a gas canister and a cooler marked bait. Everett tells her about the night he heard Maria torn apart. He tells her he's going to use her as bait to lure out a Bigfoot, who he blames for Marie's death. Lily does not want to let Everett take her anywhere. Like John Mulaney says, no secondary locations. Unless, Ozark spoiler alert, you want to end up like Ben Bird. Here, she needs to wait until Everett gets into the trunk and begins to drive. Then, she needs to use her arms to break the duct tape off her wrists by holding them out and then driving her elbows backward, pulling her wrists toward her chest with enough momentum that the tape rips in half. At that point, she can quietly remove the tape from around her feet and either wait for him to slow and leap out or go full metal on his ass. 
gas and pour the gasoline in through the open window of his truck. This should get him to stop the truck, but still be distracted to the point that she has time to escape into the woods. If he pursues, that's the point at which she can watch him from a hiding place until she can double back to the truck and drive away if he's left the keys inside, or run in the opposite direction he's currently searching. At the cabin, Jake and Oz are awoken by a knock at the door. Outside, Isabella is acting strange. She tells them that Kasdan is dead and wanders into the woods because she's hungry. The guys follow her for a distance until they find Chris trapped under a fallen tree. He tells them he saw Bigfoot as Isabella guides them to a meadow where they find Kasdan's body impaled through the mouth. Oz, Jake, and Chris strategize how to escape. Town is an hour away and they don't have the gun or the car. Isabella murmurs about Spirit of the Flesh and Chris shows them the Forest Unseen book he found. When he mentions the Wendigo, Oz tells them it's a cannibalistic beast that preys on the selfish. When the Spirit of the Flesh possesses you, you turn into a Wendigo. Oz realizes Kasdan knew there was a Wendigo before planning the trip. Isabella moans and cryptically tells the guys they're coming. Once they recognize the book's significance, they should be speed reading that thing for all the details and strategies they can find. Depending on the time of day, they need to gather any weapons they can find in the house and begin to hike into town. They may no longer have Chris's gun, which he lost in the Bigfoot encounter last night, but they have an axe, a shovel, and knives from the kitchen if nothing else. With no vehicle, two people missing, and one person confirmed dead, they need to make time while there's still sun to see by. Not to mention Isabella's sickly behavior. You don't need a degree in cryptozoology to know that Isabella is acting super sketchy, and exactly like the book tells them people possessed by the spirit of the flesh behave before they transform into Wendigos. I don't think it'd be an unpopular opinion to say that they need to shovel Isabella's head from her body before they start their hike, else you're basically traveling with somebody that just got bit by a zombie who could turn at any moment. If they aren't willing to hike that far so close to sundown, the next option is barricading the house. Considering how big a cryptid fan Oz is, it's surprising he doesn't know that Wendigos are known to be able to unlock doors and break through the windows. Those are the first points that they'll need to barricade to make it through the night. Everett guides Lily into a meadow. When he cuts her hands loose, she punches him in the face and tries to run, but he catches her and ties her to a tree. As he goes to hide, she spots a mangled dead body laying nearby and starts screaming for help. Same as with the bathroom fight. Lily needs to pick her moment. Instead of hitting him the moment he loosens her duct tape, she should feign cooperation and either kick him in the gooch to get him down to the ground where she can kick repeatedly until he passes out, or she needs to wait for the right moment to gouge out his remaining eye. At that point, she could take his weapon, return to his truck, and get out of here before anything shows up. In the cabin, Isabella tries to sleep when she sees two bright eyes staring at her. She flicks the light on to reveal the room is empty and tries to sleep with the lights on. The spirit of the flesh turns them off again. A shadow of antlers appears above the bed and the Siri on Isabella's iPad suddenly apologizes for finding no results for kill and consume the blood and flesh of the others. A second voice says, your soul belongs to me. When she gets it to shut off, the camera app turns on and Isabella is seized by the spirit of the flesh. When the possession stops, an entire hour has passed in the blink of an eye. She tries to hide under her covers, but the spirit rips the blanket off and looms over her. Meanwhile, Everett lays in wait for Bigfoot with a rifle aimed at Lily's head, when something moves behind him in the darkness. He shines a slide across the forest, but as it comes with all monsters, it's the second check that summons them. He sees three Wendigos coming for him through the forest. As he screams, Lily reaches around and unties her rope from the tree. She sees a Wendigo coming through the meadow and bolts into the forest, tripping over Everett's body. She hides behind a tree. A Wendigo approaches, but ultimately retreats as Bigfoot approaches. Everett, the supposed Bigfoot hunter, let these Wendigos get the drop on him, and for that, he deserves what he gets. As for Lily, if she could reach back all this time and undo her ties, she could have done that a long time ago. It also doesn't seem advisable to run toward Everett's screams, as that's where the threat is. Perhaps she was going after his keys and gun, but she doesn't take them after she stumbles over his body, so I don't know what she's thinking here. Especially because he's brought her way out here in the middle of nowhere to entice the Bigfoot. Back at the cabin, Isabella screams. Oz rushes into her room, slamming the door shut to see Isabella transforming and speaking in a demonic voice. She crawls across the bed towards him. Oz picks up a radio clock to kill her when she cries out in her normal voice and begs him not to hurt her. Like an idiot, he promises to help her. Unfortunately, that's one promise he won't be keeping as her transformation continues and the spirit inside her tells him she's hungry. She leaps on Oz and begins feasting. 
Oz should know better. Wendigos are cannibalistic demons that feed on selfish people. You know how I know that? Because Oz told me. If the spirit of the flesh could infect Isabella, then she's a selfish person who will likely attack if given the chance. He needs to double tap her immediately. If that doesn't kill her, it'll at least knock her out long enough for him to escape and alert the others. You can't fall for sudden feigned innocence of demons. Unless you have a cage to put her in, it's off with her head. In another part of the cabin, Chris hears a noise and opens a curtain to find a Wendigo banging its head against the window. As Chris rushes into the hall and closes the door, Lily enters and tells them they have to go. Apparently, there's a labyrinth in this cabin because Jake hears none of this. He steps outside onto the porch and sees dozens of Wendigos approaching through the field. Isabella sneaks up behind him, her teeth sharpened and dripping black goo. Lily tells Chris they're leaving with or without the others, but Chris wants to check the house for their friends. Armed with a shovel, he ventures to the porch and sees Isabella eating Jake. He manages just to close the glass door before she can get inside. Axe in hand, Lily locks a Wendigo in the bedroom, and when Chris comes looking for her, she pulls him into the closet and warns him the house is infested. While holding onto their breath, a Wendigo nearly finds them. When it leaves, Lily and Chris creep towards the door, but another Wendigo startles Chris into dropping his shovel. Lily makes it outside to find she's become separated from Chris, who's run into the cabin's lower level. There, he finds a Wendigo munching on Oz's body. Chris manages to escape outside before the Wendigo notices notices him. There he joins back up with Lily, who gives him back his shovel. Holy hell, there is an army of Wendigos out here. How is this rapidly growing population of invasive Wendigos not being recognized as more of a threat by the locals? You'd think they'd have started inviting hunters to thin the herd out a bit by now. It's bad for business to have tourists getting mowed down left and right. Since nobody nipped this thing in the bud, now we have to deal with it. If they had properly barricaded this place when they had the chance, they might have been able to keep this swarming horde of creatures at bay. Then again, they would still have to deal with Isabella. Since hiding in the closet worked so well, it might have worked to stay there until the Wendigos left the room and then quietly closed and locked the door and waited out the dawn. If anyone had bothered to read the Forest Unseen book, left for them like an Airbnb welcome gift, they would likely have known the Wendigos are the most powerful at night. Wait, did the owners leave this book out as some sort of chore list to thin out the Wendigo herd? Definitely gonna have to take a few stars off for that. Of course, they could still get attacked during the day, but they stand better chance and thus far, they haven't seen any with the sun out. Chris should have grabbed his shovel after dropping it, so he could fight off the Wendigo and stick with Lily as they escaped into the night. It's only thanks to Lily's quick thinking to go back inside and get it, and actually wait for him to find his way out, that he survives it all. Lily and Chris run into the woods and find Everett's body. They search for his keys, but a Wendigo chases them away. Afterward, the spirit of the flesh finds Everett's body and puppets him back to life. While planning to turn and attack the Wendigo's head on, the Wendigo's grab them. One rips at Lily's arm, but they're scared back by the sudden appearance of a bright light. Chris rushes over to her, but she succumbs to her injuries. He stands to find the Wendigos circling him. Chris and Lily really have two options here. The first is to run and keep running until the Wendigos are out of sight and they can either hide or gather their energy for the fight to come. The second is to press their backs together and fight. In neither case should they have hidden behind trees like this. It restricts their field of vision far too much, allowing them to be grabbed. Had they turned their backs to each other and fought, it's likely Lily would have stood a chance of surviving. All she needed to do was fend off the Wendigos for just a few moments, just long enough for Bigfoot to deus ex machina to them, or at least guaranteed herself a cushy seat in Valhalla. Now that she's gone, Chris needs to pick up her axe and have it securely by his side in the event of their attack. Instead, the spirit of the flesh appears to him. With nothing else to do, he tries roaring at the Wendigos to stay away. Something heavy lands behind him, a Sasquatch. Instead of attacking him, the Bigfoot steps forward and the fight is on. Bigfoot kicks ass and takes names as wave after wave of Wendigo pours out of the dark. Some he ends with a neck snap, others he impales or smashes into trees, or just straight up curb stomps, scaring the spirit of the flesh into retreat. As dawn breaks, Chris makes it to Everett's truck, but his windy girlfriend is waiting for him. He can't bring himself to drive her over. She chases him through Everett's truck, then underneath it. He jumps back into the truck where he finds the gas canister. As Isabella comes for him, he lights her up, then backs over her head, symbolically double tapping their unhealthy relationship. The truck sputters out over her flaming dead body, forcing him to abandon it before it explodes. 
Chris should have immediately rolled up the windows and locked the doors of his truck the second he got inside, with the key already in the ignition and the engine already purring. You couldn't pay me enough to hesitate one second longer than I'd have to in a situation like this. I'd be driving that truck out of here before Isabella even had a chance to show up. It should go without saying, but if your girlfriend starts speaking in a demonic voice after ripping the throat out of another dude, she's not your girlfriend anymore. The only reason the letter even reached the truck is to use the door as you crawl out to break her neck and crush her skull, but that's a risk he shouldn't take. He also shouldn't risk crawling under the truck. He should get to his feet and dart back around the truck, prepared to drive away as she falls out or prepared to bash her brains in with a shovel. He's just lucky she gave him enough time in the truck bed to spill the gas, find matches, light one, and throw it. Her politeness seems to be out of character, to be honest. Once she's down for the count, double tapping her is smart, but the moment the truck pops over her head the second time, he should be speeding away like his tail's on fire, because it is. Leaving the truck over a burning corpse is a great way to check the car explosion off his bucket list, but he could have avoided all that by grabbing a shovel and killing her with that instead, rather than rolling over her head. Not as cinematic, but at least you still have a truck afterwards and don't have to walk the 60 miles back to civilization. Chris begins limping away when possessed Everett appears. He has the necklace Marie and Isabella both had. He's mid-transformation and tells Chris that the last 10 years he spent trying to find Bigfoot wasn't really about Sasquatch or revenge for Marie's death. He says the Wendigo seemed to know him inside and out. Everett tells Chris the spirit of the flesh crept inside him a long time ago, and now he's just ravenous. He walks towards Chris, whistling, only to get his head lopped off by a shovel to the neck. In his final moments, Chris is picked up by one of the townies from the Sasquatch Center, who only laughs at his blood-stained clothing and thousand-yard stare. It's dead month, after all, and he did try to warn them. It's cliche to say everyone could have avoided their death by just staying home, but it's true. If they hadn't all tempted fates by going into the dangerous area during a time of year called the dead month, Everett and Marie would have remained the Wendigo's only victims. As for the others, well, it's like a cannibalistic game of chess. Any wrong or right move could have changed their fates. Isabella and Kasdan were likely doomed the moment they decided that internet access was worth driving an hour out of their way. If Chris had shared the creepy book with Oz and Jake earlier, it's possible that they both could have fled the cabin, leaving Isabella behind. If they had barricaded themselves inside, they might have survived if they had realized Isabella was turning early enough to kill her outright or force her outside. However, with the house properly barricaded, Lily wouldn't have been able to get in after escaping Everett. If Oz hadn't gone into the obviously possessed woman's room to check on her, he might have survived. If Lily hadn't waited for Chris and gone back for the shovel, she might have survived, but turned into a Wendigo for her selfishness. Like a damned if you help, damned if you don't. And ultimately, Chris only survives because of Lily's good deed, and because Bigfoot is the Superman of the forest, and because Wendigo Everett took so long monologuing that Chris had a chance to chop his head off. Yeah, this was a tough one. Because Bigfoot ex machina this whole situation, I think the cryptids in Dawn of the Beast remain unbeaten. How would you have beaten Dawn of the Beast? Let me know in the comments. Hit the like button to save a stranger's life. Hit the subscribe button to save your own. And thanks for watching. And remember, when a creepy local calls anything that you're doing a dead month, you turn around and go home.